Acts chapter 2. Now, I'm, I'm going to do something. Now, this, I did this one time. You know, John Osteen, when he was still alive, used to, used to have his church. They say, hold up your Bibles. Shake them and make the devil mad and Jesus glad. Hallelujah. Now, say, this is my Bible. And I, and I did that for, you know, you know and I, I got it from Brother Osteen. Some woman wrote me a letter. You took John Osteen's thing. What? I'm like, lady, who cares who started it? It's like somebody preaching, you know, um, Anybody ever hear Jerry Savelle preach the sermon, The Fourth Man in the Fiery Furnace? Amen. Oh, Jerry Savelle used to preach that like a wild man. But you know where Jerry got it? Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts used to preach back in the 50s, The Fourth Man in the Fiery Furnace. Yeah. yeah. Brother Copeland, about 90% of his early sermons were verbatim Brother Hagin sermons. Brother Hagin walked up to his tape table one day, looked down there and said, you could at least change the title. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Caseman, um, starting the American Fellowship of, of American Fellowship of Faith Ministries, or something like that, or Association of Faith Ministries (AFM), AF, America, uh, the Association of F uh, Faith Churches and Ministries (AFCM). That's what it was. Th that little faith aid that we have out there that's it, that came from him. You know, he let we print that. It's, it's pr pr reprintable by permission. He created that. How many like that? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Good thing to give people. Now he started his church. Now he has 600 church. Uh, about 15 years ago when I last heard him speak, he had 600 churches and ministers under him. Now he started reading Brother Hagin books for a sermon. He'd stand up in the pulpit. He'd open up the book. He'd read the book, close it, and say, let's go home. There is no scripture or revelation of any private interpretation. Amen. If it's given by the Holy Ghost, it's given for all. Yeah, that's good. Amen. <coughs> I said amen. So I said all that to say, hold up your Bible. Yeah, Shake it and make the devil mad and Jesus glad. And I say, this is my Bible. My very own Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. And I will submit my life to all that's written therein. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, Mr. C., have, you, have your headphones gotten off again? They changed channels on it. So are they going to fix them for you? Somebody going to fix them for him? His, his headphones got messed up again. Let's get them straightened out. The vibrations in his head. <laughs> He's picking up good vibrations. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. All righty. Acts chapter 2, reading from the 42nd through the 45th verse. We're talking about the church and her mission. And it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all, to all men as every man had need. And they, they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Okay, here. So we have here, and this comes on the, on the back end of um, they, they baptized 3,000 souls. And it says, and they, can, and they continue steadfastly. Yeah. We started this too on the first Sunday of the month on Sunday morning. It's talking about the church and her mission. And the first thing, the first mission of the church is evangelism. Winning the lost. Amen? Amen. And so we talked about that on the first Sunday. Go back and listen to it if you weren't here. Or watch it, you know, whichever one you prefer to do. We can now watch. Thanks to Brother Bill. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, but to evangelize. We are to, we are to win the lost, bring them into the kingdom. We, shouldn't, we, we, we don't need to be part of the church exchange program. Amen. Our mission is not to see how many people we can get to come from the other churches to our church. Our, church is to, our mission is to win the lost, to bring them into the kingdom and make disciples of all men. Amen. And to grow the church by winning the lost. Anybody can, you know, I know some guy's got some video out on YouTube now called The Myth of Church uh, of, of, of Sheep Thieving. I don't think it's a myth. God didn't, you know, of course, that, 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 that's always the people who say those kind of things are the ones who get everybody from everybody else's church. Right. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's no such thing as church thieving. You only say that when you're, the, when you're on the receiving end of getting the prophets. You don't, you don't say that when you're losing and you're, you're, you know, and you're, hurting, you're, you're hurting because half your church left and whenever somebody else's church who doesn't believe it's, it's wrong to steal. One guy said one time, uh, I, don't, I don't steal sheep, but I sure do leave the gate wide open. Yeah. Come on now. Come on now. You know, making it real, real convenient for the sheep to stray over. So evangelism is our purpose. Our, our, our first goal as the church is to win others into the kingdom. This is not a, a, a exclusive country club uh, religion where it's just about you know, those select few who can get in and the few who can, who can have uh, the, you know, uh, special rights to get in, it's about reaching all humanity with the truth. Now, I, my, when I was growing up, my family was a member of the local, uh, the, the major golf course of the Aden Golf and Country Club. In the metroplex of Aden, North Carolina, population 5,372. Salute. Home of the infamous Collard Festival. Hello. Well, we annually uh, crown a Collard Queen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have the Collard Queen. Woo! Woo! At the Collard Festival. Why does Aiden have a Collard Festival? Well, Aiden and Grifton, another town 15 miles away, Grifton uh, merged into one consolidated high school. And so you have the Aiden Grifton High School. And Grifton had a Shad Festival. Contentina Creek runs through Grifton, North Carolina, and then the spring of the year, the Hickory Shad run, and which is not, they're not even worth eating. People just like to fish them because they're good fishing, I guess. And they have a shad festival. Well, not to be outdone by the Grittonites, the Adenites decided they must have their own festival, which they had at the end of the summer because collards were growing real well. They came up with the Collard Festival. Not to be outdone in Winterville, five, seven miles from Aden on the Greenville side, in the past 10 years or so, has come up with the Watermelon Festival. So you could just go down to the Greenville area and go, and then of course Bethel on the other side of Greenville has the Unity Festival. And so you could just hi, go down to Pitt County and just basically go festival to festival to festival in the metroplex communities of Bethel, Winterville, Aden, and Grifton. Hallelujah. I said all that for some reason. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why well, did I say all that? I was talking about evangelizing, wasn't I? Yes. What's that guy? I, I had a great point. I had a, this awesome point about my hometown. Oh, the golf course. The golf, yeah, yeah. Our Christianity is not an exclusive religion. Now, Aiden has the Aiden Golf and Country Club. And you've got... It's a private golf course. Hmm. Membership only. Now, and only, only, only guests that can play must play at the uh, request of a member. Now, when I first moved to Aden, Aden was, I, I drove into town. We, we, we went downtown Aden, and I had never seen this. Now, I, I, I was born in Greenville. And had grown up mostly in Greenville. We were moving to Aden. And when I went through downtown Aden for the first time as, a, as about a, uh, let's see, fifth grader, Whatever, however you are in fifth grade. I saw for the first time, this is 1969. 
I saw for the first time in my life a, a sign on in front of a restaurant that said whites only. The city cafe and on the other side was a city cafe that had a sign that said blacks only. And then I went down to the city barbershop and they had a sign over there that said whites only. And on the other door they had a sign that said blacks only. Exclusive. I mean, you know, you know, you know you're thinking, you got to be kidding me. I'd never seen anything like it. I, I was, you know, as a kid, I, I mean, that, that made an indelible impression on my mind. I'd never seen that. But there it was, right there in Aiden, North Carolina. Yes, sir, buddy. Well, the Aiden Golf and Country Club was a private club, and but anybody could play if, as a, at request of a member, except they had it open that anybody that came in that wanted to play was a guest of the pro, golf pro, unless they weren't white. They excluded anybody that was black, saying, I'm sorry, you can't play here. This is members only. Unless, if you walked in, if you were white, and you never know anybody in the place, you played as a guest, as a guest of, the, of the golf pro if you were white. Now, let me say that, that that's a racial, we understand that's racism and that's racial. But you know what? We can, we can get that, that same spirit operates on different veins. Yeah. It didn't just, you know, and mainly in that area, it operated on racial lines, but that's a spirit. Yeah. That gets into men, mm -hmm. and they and they they fall prey to that, and they yield to that. Now, actually, and th that got changed um, about seventy-two or so, because somebody came in. They actually sued the golf course because they, they figured out what the deal was. They sued it, and, and of course, to keep f from being so bad, they changed the rules. You know, because they didn't want they didn't want to pay all the money, which which I'm glad they did. I mean, it's ridiculous. It was one of those ridiculous, you know, one of them honky rules. Anyway. And I can say that because I'm a honky, all right? All right? <laughs> you know, there's there certain things that black folks can say I can't get away with. They call each other names I better not call them. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, but I'm, I'm wet. I call me a honky, all right? That was a honky rule. Anyway, uh, but that spirit of exclusivity based on a certain criteria, it just operates in men in all kinds of different ways. Huh? We can't let that in the church. Now, listen, I know racism has been in the church, and I'm not addressing that this morning. I was just trying to make a point about exclusivity. The church is not a country club. Yeah. It's not a place of exclusivity. Amen. It is a place of inclusiveness. Amen. Now, do we, do we include the homosexual, the practicing homosexual? No. You must be born again. I mean, the, the only the exclusivity part of the church is you must be saved. Yeah. Yeah. We go reach the lost, we win the lost, and we disciple them in Christ. But the, the, but that's, but the, the exclusivity is the church is the believer. But see, we got this stuff in the church now. You know, if, you, if you're not quite like us, or you don't wear certain kind of clothes, or you don't run in certain circles. I was talking to Janie the other day. And um, my family was, was the outcast of our, our, of our particular denominational church. Now it was run by, I can give you the names of the families that ran the church. How, how many have been in churches like that? Yeah. <coughs> you know who runs the church. Y'all here? Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, everybody that's, that, that, that's, that's the hot shot in the church is kin to one of those families. That's right. Somehow. That's not God. Nope. Right. Correct. Well, my family was the outcast family. We, we were one of the families that, you know, <laughs> they didn't like to tell everybody about. <laughs> Hello. My family used to tithe until they found out that the families that ran the church had a, were sitting at somebody's house one night and discussing who gave and how much they gave to the church. Wow. Oh. I said, Ma, I told my I said, that's, that's, that's nobody's business. Right, right. You don't do that kind of stuff. But, you know, they ran the church. They, 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 they knew everything. They ran everything. Well, the church has a mission to reach the lost, to disciple them, amen, and bring them up in Christ. Now, we talked about evangelism. So I, I'm, I'm saying this. Understand, we are not a country club. Amen. This is not about, listen, you got, you got churches that are, that are, that are in the community that their draw, that their congregation is made of social elitists who all hang together. And, and they don't want you in there if you're not part of that group. 
Well, that's not the, that's not the way of the Lord. Thank you for the three blank stares, the two grunts, the four help me Jesus, and the one amen I heard out there somewhere. <laughs> We're to evangelize and go win the lost. Amen. Then, when, we, when the lost are won, we're to unify them around the doctrine of the, of the apostles. And we spent last week talking about the authority of the Word of God and how valid the Word of God is and how important the Word of God is. And then you got yo-yo brains out there now saying, what about the illiterate? You don't have to have a Bible. You can, get, you can grow just as much in Jesus without, without a Bible as you can with one. As a matter of fact, the Word of God is not final authority. Jesus, the living Jesus is. And they, they're on all this crazy stuff. Yeah, if you'll read the Bible, Paul, t I, I read this, so I say this week, um, a friend of mine, Guy Dunnick, said this. He said, if the written words wasn't important, then why did Paul say that one of the advantages the Jew had was they were stewards of the written word Amen. or stewards of the scriptures. Amen. 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 Did you know 63 times in the Gospels and in the, in the, uh, in, in the epistles that the writers or Jesus himself said this phrase in support of a teaching of the New Testament? It is written. Yeah. 63 times that phrase is used in support of New Testament teaching and doctrine. Amen. It is written. Somebody said, the apostles didn't have a Bible. Then what were they, what were they quoting? It is written. Yeah. Yeah. What were they, what were, where were they referring to when they said it is written? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, we, we unify around the doctrine of the apostles. And we're to, in other words, we're to train people up in the Word of God. And we all need to be trained up. We know, um, we're teaching the ABCs of faith on, Friday, on Wednesday nights. You know, the Lord told Brother Hagin a number of years ago, and, and he, did a, he did a teaching along those lines. Um, now, I'm not using, I mean, I've got a whole different set of notes than what he's, he's teaching from in, in that series. But the, the idea is the same. The Lord said many preachers preach faith where they are now instead of where people are. That's good. And, and then people who are just starting out get lost because right. they're, they're teaching them where they are now in faith instead of being able to go back and help people who are just getting started out. See, the mission of the church is to grow people up. Right. Right. Well, you can't grow them up. You know, uh, if, if, you know, Greg's an adult, Gina's an adult, I mean, and, and Buster Brown, he's, he's grown up a little bit. But if, if we came in when they brought the little baby home and started shoving steak down her throat like she was Greg or Gina's age, uh -huh. it'd choke her. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we, we've, already, we've, already fed, we've already fed out the little stuff. You guys, they're, they're grown up now. Now, you can't do that. Right, right. Church has an obligation to disciple. No, Jesus didn't say, Jesus never said go make converts. He said go make disciples. Yeah. Part of that discipleship is training them up in the Word of God. Right, to be stewards of the mysteries of God. Amen. To be faithful to the things of God. Amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. And so evangelism is the first thing we do. Discipleship and, and in other words becoming unified around the doctrines of the apostles is the second thing the church does. We have to be faithful to those things. We are not to try to get people in any way, shape, or form under any cost, any circumstance just so we can have numbers. We're to win the lost. The Bible said that the disciples went everywhere preaching the word, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. And then it says here that after the disciple, after 3,000 were added to the church, they steadfastly remained, uh, uh, continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. Amen. They were trained in the things of the God's word. Yep, right. Not what you feel. Not some revelation somebody has outside the Word of God. They were trained in the Apostles' doctrine. Right. Now you'll have to go back to last week to get my teaching on that line of how that Peter uh, gave authority, apostolic authority and, uh, uh, and um, approval to Paul's writings as doctrine and Scripture. Now you go back last week, listen to last week, because I've got it in there. And he even gave it to himself. He, he, he confirmed his teaching as, as uh, 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 divine authority. Paul's writings as divine authority in Scripture. Peter did that. So we have to go back and listen to that to hear, hear that again. I don't have time to cover that again this week. So it says they, they remain steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. Now, from Wednesday night, we all came together and had a chicken and pastry dinner. That's not what it's talking about. 
The Greek word fellowship is koinonia. 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 Okay? And it, it means that which they had in common and shared, actually even going to the point of communion. We're not talking about the fact that we got together and ate chicken and pastry together. Now we call that fellowship. Let me understand this. Let me read, let me read this uh, from, to you from the, um, the uh, book, The Foundations of Pentecostal Theology, um, printed by Life Bible College. It says here, the church is to sustain a fellowship of believers. The early church was rich in fellowship. The Greek word fellowship is koinonia, which means that which they had in common or shared communion. The passage in Acts goes on further to define fellowship and all that were believe and, and all that believed were together and had all things in common. Now the biblical word fellowship is frequently misunderstood and misapplied. In terms such as fellowship circle, fellowship hall, fellowship day, the meaning of fellowship is related usually to games, dining, and social interaction. The above mentioned activities when they conform to biblical ethics are perfectly innocent and useful to the life of the church. But when we reserve the biblical word fellowship to refer to them, we sadly reduce our concept of fellowship, koinonia, the following are scriptural uses of fellowship, or koinonia. The fellowship of the ministering of the saints, 2 Corinthians 4, 8. Let's look over there. Referring to charities, 2 Corinthians 4, 8. We'll just let you see it. In where? Your Bible. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 8, 4. <laughs> Praying with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry of the saints. See, it's not talking about eating. It's actually talking about charities. They gave to Barnabas and Paul the right hands of fellowship. Galatians chapter 2 verse 9. Galatians 2 9. It says they gave them what? They extended to them or gave to them. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of Koinonia, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. We didn't talk, we weren't talking about going out and eating together, was it? Talking about right hand of we have things in common. Amen. <clears throat> um, acceptance or accepting and including, including inclusiveness. <clears throat> Others into the body. Look at Ephesians 3, 9. Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship, koinonia, of the mystery which was from the beginning of the world, which hath been hid in God and created all things by Christ Jesus. Here it's talking about the mystery of the fellowship, uh, the, what, what, what's from the beginning, what? Participation in the body. Amen. For your fellowship in the gospel of Philippians 1, 5. That's right before Colossians. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Talking about participation in salvation. Chapter 2 verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ. If any comfort. If any fellowship of the spirit. If any bowels of mercy. It's talking about here unity which is the spirit effects. Going on now with reading this. Perhaps the Apostle John in his first letter summarizes the clearest applications of biblical fellowship. 1 John 1, 3 and then verses 6 and 7. So chapter 1, verses 3, 6 and 7. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. If we say we have fellowship, koinonia, with him, and walk in darkness, we know what it, no, remember back there, things in common, communion. He said if you have communion, if you say I have communion with God and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship or communion, amen, one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So then, fellowship is, first of all, having a common relationship to the Father and the Son in the body of Christ, where we are united by the Spirit in the bonds of love, unity, and singleness of purpose.
The fe this fellowship of believers extends to all mutual activities that are God-honoring, including dining together in the fellowship hall. Now, all that to say this. So then the fellowship the Bible refers to is that we have a common bond. Yes. Now what most groups and churches even try to do is they try to find common social bonds and bind people together. Brother Bill's a computer geek, so we get all the computer geeks and they hang out with Bill. Amen. Yeah. Brother Dick's a musician, so we get all the musicians together, they hang out with Brother Dick. Hello. Mr. C is a walking encyclopedia of historical events. So we get all the people who like history hang out with Mr. C. He, he can share some stuff with you. He's got some of the coolest gadgets in his house. <laughs> I looked up there the other day and saw a World War II radio, era radio. You said it still works, didn't you? Oh, yeah. It's got eight track. <laughs> <laughs> now, Miss Geraldine's Indian. So we get all the Indians hand together to Miss Geraldine. Y'all see what I'm doing? Churches do it this way. Yeah. And what we think we're doing, we think we're creating commonity in our midst and getting people to come to church because everybody's got these little, these little, what we've, what we've created cliques. And then each little group comes up with their own purpose for being involved. When we miss it, it starts at the top with the common bond of being in fellowship with God the Father and the Son and joined together by the work of the Holy Ghost. You see, I shouldn't be able, I shouldn't go, well, I can't go have fellowship with Bill. Bill talks in binary and hexadecimal. <laughs> All right? You know, uh, I, I shouldn't go, I can't go hang out with Mr. C. I hate history. Are y'all here? You've gone home. You see, when we start doing this in the church, and churches do it all the time. We do it all the time. Trying to get groups to find something in common. And I understand it, but what I think we have done is we have missed fostering coming together because we serve and are born of the same spirit. Amen. We have, the thing that we have in common that should cause us to have koinonia yeah. is we are born again. Mm -hmm. We are believers. God is our father. And it doesn't matter if you're, I am not a musician. Ask my son. I don't sing well. I'm, get, I, I'm listen, here, here's the deal. I'm better than I used to be. Oh, yeah. You should have. <laughs> Put his face on the camera. I want everybody to see what clown there was in the church. Someone like, hallelujah. Right there, yeah. Just raise your hand and say guilty. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I can't go, I can't go, have, uh, can't go out and, and be around Dick because I'm not a musician. Well, we, what we've done, we've kind of gone down and spread things out instead of going up. Because, you see, the church is not about having, you know, the technology group think we ought to have more technology. And the history group thinking we ought to be, you know, be more in touch with the roots. And the singing group, we ought to have better music. The, 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 the yeah. fellowship of the church comes around the single purpose of we are born of God and are called to the common entity and the unity of the faith and the communion of the saints to carry out the purpose of the Father in the earth. Yeah. It is not about what we have in common right. in the natural I'm going to be honest with you. If you only hang around people that you've got stuff in common with, you won't grow. I'm talking about in the natural. You'll just stay in your own little world. I mean, think about it now. 
There's a whole world out there. I mean, there's people who don't like to get outdoors. I got, I got, we got a, my wife has a relative actually. Blood relative. <laughs> same mama and same daddy. Uh -oh. <laughs> and he ain't one of her brothers. Anyway. <laughs> Girl hates the outdoors. And we, we're not talking about you know, bugs. I mean, I, I, I never understood why she would go watch the movie Arachnophobia and she hates spiders. Why would you just go feed on that, you know? There's a world out there to, to venture into and to see and to explore. But if you hate being outdoors and never venture out there, you'll never see it. You'll never experience it. And when we come to the, when we come and we, we try to only come to churches that have, you know, listen, there are people who only want to go to churches that have rock and worship. They don't care what they preach as long as they got rock and worship. <laughs> they just don't care. They really don't care what's coming out of the pulpit as long as they can groove to the scene on the gangster sheen while the music's going on. <laughs> now, I really dated myself with that one, didn't I? <laughs> Yeah, diamond, <laughs> diamond in the back, TV antenna, gangster white walls. Moving in the scene to the gangster scene. All right, anyway. Did you ever have one of them cars, Jerry? Couldn't afford. Couldn't afford. <laughs> I've got to look at Marty. Now, Marty's had about every kind of car there is. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I, I bet you Denise would have had a, tr a, a tow truck up there pulling it out of the driveway. <laughs> <coughs> had a what now? Pinto. Pinto. Oh, my. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> We're so glad God delivered you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got my Harley now. All right. The church, the, the, the idea of fellowship in the church is not to come to church and find everybody that you have something in common with in the natural so you can go keep doing that. The idea of the church is we come together for a single purpose. So that's what gets lost in this. We lose sight of the purpose of the church. We come looking for natural needs to be fulfilled instead of coming to fulfill a spiritual responsibility. <laughs> Woo! That went over real good. I said we come looking for natural needs to be fulfilled instead of looking to fulfill a spiritual responsibility. I may as well just cuss in some churches. Hell, I may as well just let certain bombs drop say, as a say responsibility. The church has a single purpose. We have a purpose. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, how are you going to go preach to every creature if all you can talk about is, you know, uh, parody switches and binary and how many bits something's done in? And, you know, you just read your core dump last week in hexadecimal. <laughs> Brother Bill said, I've done age myself again. <laughs> Reading a core dump in hex. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Yeah. It's not a pretty, you never, ever, when you were a programmer, you never, ever wanted to hear the machine start going shkum -shkum 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 and start dumping out pages and pages and pages of hexadecimal. That's just not what you wanted. But when we, if we come into the church and we simply limit our activity within the church to the things that we are naturally interested in, how do we position ourselves to fulfill the divine purpose of the church, which is that we all come together, we have, a, we have a common bond, we have a common unity, we have a common purpose. God has called us into the fellowship of the saints. We are to be in fellowship with him. We are not here. Understand, it's all right to have dinners. We do that. And, and we like to have in the dinners. We like to sit down with everybody. That's fun. It's good. As long as we understand it within, within the construct that it is not what we refer to as fellowship. That is not the fellowship of the saints. That's eating together. And that's fun. It's okay. 
it, but it is not the purpose of the church. Amen. The purpose of the church is to evangelize, disciple, grow up. We come together with a purpose and a bond with God. God is what we have in common. Amen. Our relationship with the Lord is what we have in common. Amen. Hello. Amen. Y'all hear you gone home. Now, Benny was an aircraft mechanic. I would have had no need to have met Benny in the natural. What brought me and Benny to the same place? The fellowship of the saints. We have a common Lord. We have a common, something that we have in common is our relationship with the Lord. Amen. Are you here? Amen. Y'all here? You gone home? I can go by each one of you. You got different lives. You got different interests. You got different things. But the reason we come together is not because we have those natural things in common. Hello. Now look, look. Marty loves cars. Loves to fix up cars. Loves to go to car shows. It. I like to see cool cars. It just don't do a whole lot to me to go to a car show. But Marty loves the Lord. He's my brother. What we have in common is not our love for car shows. What we have in common is our love for the Lord. <clears throat> and that's what brings us together. That is the bond. Now, when I was talking about that exclusivity earlier, see when you get families who run churches, <clears throat> what they have in common is their relationship with one another. That's wrong. It's not about that Aunt Louise has her name on the back of the chair and a gold little, uh, on a gold-colored little thing that says, given in memory of Aunt Louise. I told somebody, I said, if you're in a church and the only reason you're in there is because it's a gold tag, go get a screwdriver. <laughs> take it off the back and take it with you. Just go put it wherever you go next. Oh. If you've got stained glass windows, get a, get a stained glass guy to come in and replace that panel and take it with you. <clears throat> The church is not about the such and such family and the such and such family and the such and such family or the families of that church. No, 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 no. The family of God is the family in the church. Our common, our common drawing card, our, our unity, our communion is based on the fact we're born of God. That's why there, I don't believe in segregated churches. Because you can't have a church that says, because you're a different color, you can't come into our, our communion. Hello. Amen. Are you here? Amen. We had the same Lord. Yes. So then we're all, we all had the same common bond of being born of God. Amen. Amen. All joined together in the Spirit. So then, when Greg hurts and Greg needs help, Brother Bill's around. Yeah. When Miss, Mr. C hurts, Ron's around. When different ones are in different places and need help, it's not the computer group or the history group or the musical group. It is the bond of the body. We being many are one body. Amen. Amen. And the body is compacted and, by, by, and joined together. Forget it. Ephesians 4. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave something out that I don't need to leave out. Ephesians 4, 16, from whom the whole body, well, 15, back, back at verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, chapter 4, verse 15 of Ephesians. From whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, make of increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Who's supplying? The body is. Yeah. And, and he even talks about one place. Um, 
Where it says, you know, well, you can't say because I'm not the hand, you know, the head I'm not important, or I'm not the foot this, or I'm not the eye that, and so forth and so on. No. Understand, I'm the, I'm the tech group, you're the history group, we don't help you guys. See, we have to get back to understanding that we as a body come out of the head, Christ. And that we are compacted together and joined together. Amen? According to the infection work of measure of every part and every joint supplies in our common, in our communion and in our koinonia. And that which we have in common and that fact that we have in common. I'm going to tell you something. There are people in here that have absolutely nothing in natural in common with other people in here. They don't have the same background. They don't have the same history. They don't have the same this. They don't even have the same dreams and goals in some areas of life. But they've both come into the family of God. Amen. And they have a communion and they have a um, shared relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father God bound by the Spirit of God in unity that makes them uniquely come bound together in spiritual communion, in koinonia. And we have to come to this realization that when we come into the church, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to have a, a, a paradigm shift away from it's all about the natural. It's all about the you know the the, the the you know the natural things and all about all that stuff and get, and get back to understanding that it, it must. I don't listen. Now when I say all this, don't think I want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and the, the, any natural things are wrong and anything we do natural is wrong. I want we have to have a shift in our thinking and a shift in our purpose and a shift in our in our operation to understand that those things can be outgrowths of the spiritual. Koinonia. They can come out of that, but they are not the Koinonia. Amen. Amen. So that we don't lose focus of the purpose of our Koinonia, which is to fulfill the purpose of God in the earth. And that is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Amen. Are you here? You gone home? Amen. You got some preachers running around saying that God designed it for them to be rich, Amen. while others are poor. One guy in our city said, you know, I mean, uh, on television, said God makes some folks, uh, some people, uh, uh, poor, so God can work out compassion in rich folks. Well, I know some poor people who would be really glad when the rich folks get the compassion revelation. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> we must regain a sight and a sense of why we are here. Hello. You have a purpose greater than getting up tomorrow morning and enjoying the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday and staying home. And then going back to work on Tuesday or school on Tuesday. Your purpose in life is greater than that. Amen. Your purpose in life is greater than being the lead team leader of your church social group. We have a calling and a purpose to win the nations to the kingdom of God. And it must start understanding that our commonity, our communion, our fellowship, our singleness of purpose starts in Christ. Amen. Not in our hobbies and likes and dislikes. Amen. Amen. I'm just kind of looking around the room seeing what, what, what I'm getting here. I got four people looking at me like a cow at a new gate. <laughs> Like a dog in a new bowl. <laughs> Hallelujah. Like pastor at sushi. <laughs> I ain't eating that. <laughs> Under any circumstances. I'll just believe God for manna. <laughs> <laughs> 
Of course, when I'm looking at sushi, that is manna. What is it? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, what, so what, what am I saying here in one, in one vein? One vein I'm having to say this. We can't have cliques in the church. Well, I only, listen, I don't like them. They, we don't have anything in common. I, shame on you. They're born of the same God you're born of. Their father's your same father. Their Lord's your same Lord. Come on now. Amen. Amen. Well, I like to hang out with people. I, you, know, listen, you keep hanging out with people. You've got something in common with to tell you what you want to hear. Then you're just going to live a, a limited life. Amen. I'm going to sing. I'm going to write a song called the Old Me Song. Now, David Engel saying wrote a song, Brother Hagin, from one of Brother Hagin's sermons called Don't Shout Me Down because I'm preaching real good. Yeah. Don't shout me down now because I'm preaching real good. <laughs> How come me you get off on a thing like this? Yep. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. Amen. So, if the church was going to sustain a fellowship of believers, a koinonia of believers, that must be what we come together for. You shouldn't come in here this week to see what, if, they've got, if they've got a new song this week. Now, I know people who go to church. They're just waiting for the newest, hottest, greatest thing. You know, can't wait to buy the new album from the church worship team because it's cooking. Come on, man. And they're all about the worship. I mean, if they got up with the Southern Gospel Quartet and sang it all in, in four-part harmony Southern Gospel. Now, you might like that. My, my wife actually likes that. My definition of tolerance is I can listen to that for a little while. <laughs> All right? It just doesn't float my boat. But you know what? I don't come to church because of the style of the music or, the, how, the worship, or how great the worship is. We come because we have a common purpose in communion with the Lord. And that has to be not because Pastor Ed visited me three times this week. Amen. And I'm staying home because he didn't visit me this week. <laughs> or I'm coming because found out Jody's going to be there. Found out that Stevie's going to be there. You come to church because somebody else is going to be there. You're coming for the wrong reason. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. If you come because of a person being there or not being there, you'll never be stable. The koinonia is beyond natural things and is the basis and the beginning of the unity of the body. Not backwards. You don't get people hooked up here and here and here and get them to be part of the body. They're part of the body and all these other things that grow out of that. Can you say amen? amen. So, the fellowship of the believers is important. Look with me, if you will, in Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to close here. I, got, I went to a couple weeks in a row. I went three, an hour and ten minutes. We're not going that long today. Hmm. Somebody told me, Pastor, I was up at four o'clock in the morning, couldn't sleep, so I turned you on. You, went, you preached an hour and ten minutes. Really? <laughs> I go to? Okay. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now look, the fellowship of his sufferings. In other words, Jesus suffered for us. We have a communion in that suffering in that he bore it for us. Amen? We don't have to carry it. He bore it for us. We have a communion with him. I'm telling you, we have a communion with everybody around the fact that Jesus suffered for all of us. 
And that whatever people are going through, Jesus bore it for them. And that we have a communion with them, praise God. We have got, I'm telling you, we, if, we, if we could just get back to coming to church because we have a common entity and the fact that we're, we're born of God and not who's going to be there and who's not going to be there and uh, which person I'm mad at and which person I'm not mad at and, and I'm not sitting over here because so-and-so is sitting over here and get back to that's my brother and that's my sister and they're washed in the same blood that I'm washed in. Glory to God. Hallelujah. They're born of the same spirit I'm born of. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And we start at the top in our communion and learn to, lo to, to love each other as we love the Lord together. Oh my. Amen. So often, too often we come because so and so goes to church here. Or that one goes to church here. Or I, I, there's a bunch of people in that church I got something in common with. And you come in and you, well, you, you're starting on the lower plane expecting the higher plane benefits. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You're expecting the benefits of communion with the Lord because you're having communion around a, a certain like. And it doesn't work that way. You have to start in your koinonia of the Lord. The Montria and Karen and Jesse and my wife and Gina are bound together yeah. by something greater. Because mm -hmm. I, I all four of them have four different types of careers, four different <coughs> lifestyles. But we're all bound <coughs> in the Lord. We're one in the Spirit. We're part of the same body. What affects Gina affects Montreal. Because we're part of the same body. I want to tell you something. You don't believe me? Greg, come here and let me step on your toe. <laughs> That's going to affect the rest of your body. Yeah. Yeah. Break a toe and see if it doesn't affect the rest of your body. You got that, right? You're the next thing you know, you got your hip out. <laughs> Hello. Got the hip ache, the knee ache, the foot ache. <laughs> Hello? And because you're walking crooked, don't have your right, whatever. If you're like me, you walk right into the door jam head first. <laughs> now you forgot about your toe because your head hurts. <laughs> that is, when you get up out of the floor from being knocked out. <laughs> the body of Christ is joined together with Christ being the head. We receive everything, every instruction from the head and work together to carry out that single purpose of the head of the church. Amen. Can somebody say amen? amen. Say, help me, Jesus, if you didn't like it. <laughs> oh. Say, so that's right, Pastor, if you did. That's right. Only three people said that. Say, second Timothy Day! If you just have to hear it again. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Father, I thank you that as we embrace the understanding that our calling is higher, than natural common connections. Our calling to the koinonia of God is based on our bonding together through the blood of Jesus. That we are born of the same spirit. The same spiritual DNA resides in each of us. That our Father is the Father of all, that our Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that we all live under the same blood-stained banner of our Master. Help us, Lord, to understand the singleness of purpose of the church to win the lost. And that our goal and our purpose is to walk in light of that directive from the head of the church himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is also the head of the body of which we are. Let us see differently. Let us see not as man sees and not as man ideas are, but let us see as the light of the word of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will reveal to us that we are brought together to serve, to work, and to walk in harmony under our communion with the Father. In Jesus' name, amen.